group in prison right now. Okay, greetings, everybody. My name is Ama, and um, I uh, graduated, have a master's in clinical rehabilitation counseling and clinical mental health counseling. And I am studying for, I'm going to do both, but I'm um, in terms of CRSD and mental health. I'm focusing on um, the mental health. And um, I'm going to be presenting on demand side employment. And um, we're going to, yeah, just get started and bear with me. I'm a little nervous. And I hope I do okay <laughs> with this. I wish this part wouldn't record it. So I'm not going to make all these disclaimers. So just be patient with me. Thank you very much. Don't worry about oh. the disclaimers. I got us on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I we'll talk about exactly what demand-sided employment is on this the chapter recovery. I think it was chapter nine in the book. So basically, this is the information that's presented there. Um, and the, the learning objectives of it is for us to understand one, the, uh, the key words to understand employment situations, employment perceptions, disability legislation, effective disability inclusion, policies, procedures, and practices. So all of this relates to, as it says with the first one, with people with disabilities, understanding what the situations are. And the perceptions, a lot of it's for demand sided is about the perceptions around hiring people with disabilities and reducing the stigma and stereotype and judgment. Uh, legislation as it relates to employment with people with, with um, disabilities. And we know it's like the crux of a lot of the stuff that we go over in terms of the various. Um, Kiss. Last hello. One. Oh, sorry. Okay. And um, in terms of inclusion, um, the process and procedures and practices that they increase employment opportunities and quality of employment for people with, dis with disabilities. I worked briefly in the area of supported employment. And so, you know, one of the key things was that for all of us is to have a quality of life and be able to contribute um, to society in whatever way we see fit. And I think that's like the base of even what we're trying to do here in, in being CRC. So the key concepts and what you're going to talk about each one of these are eight areas, the benefits of meaningful work experiences, two, disability employment statistics, three, the state federal vocational rehabilitation programs, demand side employment, demand side employment issues related to hiring, return to work and retention. Six, disability inclusion and in practice, practice research. Seven, effective disability inclusion practices. And eight, disability inclusion strategies and techniques. Okay. Now, the first thing, uh, to, the first area was to talk about, was to talk about meaningful work experiences. And so some, and I tried to highlight some of the key things and, with that is to be able to have gainful employment and what it says is defined as a job position in which employees receive steady work and payment for their from their employers that um, have many known financial so, social financial psychological and social benefits to their overall health if you're paid for uh, something that you want to do and it's consistent. And that um, a good job with benefits enables working, working adults to provide for themselves, care for their families, have access to health care, connect with people, and live with dignity. As I mentioned earlier, to contribute to society. Some of the, uh, the benefits, continue on to benefits of meaningful work experience is our work identity. What is that? So generally, we're talking about identity and it's, it talks about the meaning, the meaning of people's jobs and its relationship to their sense of being. And um, say it's a large part of a person's self-identity, your work identity and your self-identity have some, they overlap. So it's people perceptions of who they are 
you know, as it relates to what they do. And um, as it as is a requisite component for living a purposeful and meaningful life. And so what that means, conversely, we're looking at unemployment, income equity, inequity, um, poverty. And these are things that are associated with poor physical health and mental health, other issues, alcohol, domestic violence, low self-esteem. Um, these things help to lower, lower one's level of life satisfaction. And it's impacted due to loss of income and access to quality health care, stigma, social isolation, and psychological stress. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go back to that slide. Mm -hmm. This is a Twitter group here. In your experience in working with people with disabilities, is it true to say that people with disabilities who are working have a much happier outlook in life than those who are not working? I mean, how do you define happiness, I guess? In terms of life satisfaction, like doing being productive versus unproductive. I mean, I think it depends on the person's that, uh, like worldview. Some people um, with disabilities, they can't grasp the concept of production or productivity. Um, and therefore, they don't know what they're not reaching or meeting or um, what they're kind of missing out on. And, um, I mean, I think, I think generally, you know, disability is so vast, right? So, um, I think that for people, if we look at, um, people with disabilities who have definitely have capacities to work, um, yeah, they're definitely more happy when they're, um, have routines and are out in the community, out doing things, um, having, autonomy and independence, having relationships that are their own, having social capital. Ooh. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when uh, there are, so <clears throat> what are the statistics in terms of dis dis um, disability and employment? What is, what is the, st the, st the, st the stat saying? <laughs> and one, we're looking at in order to make up the statistics, we're looking at the combination or intersection of disability, unemployment, and poverty. So, um, and that makes people with disabilities highly susceptible to negative consequences of employment and poverty. Now, I want to skip over to the next component here. And the, the book or the research is even talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the employment to population ratio with disability. So basically it was saying it's an increase. So compared to employment to population ratio, 70% of people without disabilities, the disabilities employment gap of 41% is strikingly large. So, um, and it's saying that there's an urgent need to have innovative employment interventions that can improve employment outcomes. Okay. Now I grabbed this. This is from the Department of Labor and Statistics. Um, there were two charts. I just thought I'd put one up here to kind of look at where we are with, with people, with persons with disabilities and the labor force um, participation ratio. They have all of these things here. And um, basically, what it is saying is that there is a discrepancy, discrepancy, the, the, the discrepancy with people who have disabilities and access to work. That's it in, in a nutshell, but it's definitely um, increasing, all right, in terms of the employment rate. It's, it's going by age, you know, age set, and then male and female. So um, you can just see that in different areas, there's some variation. So I just, I just kind of put it here just to show that this, this information is out there. Now, in terms of the state, the federal vocational rehabilitation program, um, in addition that they serve more than 
one million people um, with disabilities per year as of with the um, 2021. Um, that the both the, the the programs, the VR program has a history of assisting people with disabilities to achieve their independent living and employment goals. And um, yeah, that's the one thing I wanna highlight that's here in terms of what it actually does. So it, it is saying that also that there is a need for people who are aware and want to work and have some means that they will want to do it. And so the vocational re rehabilitation, the VR programs help to do that. And that the rehabilitation counselors, uh, which some of us would be or are, uh, use the supply side employment approach to provide um, VR services. And that includes focusing on providing medical, psychological, social, educational services to improve the functioning stigma and job skills of people with disabilities. The demand side, which is a focus like the chapter talked about, the demand side of employment. Now, that has a focus on workplace culture and disability inclusion practices. So one side of the VR is helping to um, look at the, the conditions or helping to prepare or make opportunities available um, for the client. And this was when demand side is looking at the employment. What is the culture like? How are people being made aware? What is their sensitivity? So you have the um, WIOA Act, right? Um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act that has an emphasis on local labor market analysis, labor engagement, and customized training. Is anybody here familiar with that? Heard of the WIOA, if I can see, let me just put her. I, I, I am, in fact, my program is WIOA. Uh, a lot of our funds come from that. And we do focus a lot, though, well, at least my development center is, Workforce Development Center is focused on that. So if you ever go to an American Job Center or look up careeronestop.org, I'll put it in the chat later, uh, you can find a list of local workforce development centers near you that usually have a WIOA program. Now, if you were here from the beginning or near in the several weeks back, remember WIOA came out in 2014 and for VR, you have to use 15% of that funds for youth with disabilities. So that's why this is also applicable in here. But if you have any other questions about WIOA, let me know. I'd be more than happy to talk about it. That's, yeah, that's my some, baby where I work at. <laughs> yeah, and some of them, like I'm in, in I'm here in Maryland, DC. So right with the terms of the training, it's often connected to reemployment or reemployment services, connected to unemployment services, so that when someone is unemployed, they go to the state for reemployment. So for example, I forget what it's called now, when I managed a program was early intervention. So we helped to prepare people as soon as they were unemployed with various skills and opportunities. And then people can get fun. This is another way people can get funding and even education when they don't have access. Be you um, a person with disabilities or not, this is something that's still available. So the second thing to in VR is, a theory, a concept of um, work adjustment. And it, and, it, and it has been applied as a theoretical, as a framework for case conceptualization, assessment, plan development, and provisions for medical, psychosocial, educational, and employment services. Um, and so it focuses on work adjustment as being, it is an optimal outcome for people with disabilities, okay? And what is successful work adjustment is <laughs> indicated by a um, worker's job tenure, like how long are they staying? And, and that is, an, is, there are two factors that are associated with it. One is job satisfaction and job satisfactoriness. <laughs> And the theory says that people will more likely to stay in a job that um, satisfies their needs, values, and interests. And, and I will actually say this kind of, in some of the, a lot of these uh, other theories, 
they look at that. If you are, if it's something you enjoy, you're going to do well at it. So, um, and it says that other side, when people cannot perform their jobs satisfactory, it is likely that they will be terminated. That um, successful adjustment, therefore, um, ensures by only by placing individuals in a work environment that provides maximum correspondence between their abilities and um, and their job requirements, as well as that as really between their needs, values, and interests. So it's a, a constant reinforcement. The other thing I was, um, I think I was on a pro a podcast or a workshop recently. And in terms of job satisfaction, they also uh, mentioned the relationship with your supervisor who is managing you. So if that manager does not value you or see you as an asset, that usually that leads to low job satisfaction why people leave a job, either if you have a disability or not. So I have a question for everybody is, what factors do you think influence employers' decision to include people with disabilities in the workplace? How much it's going to cost? Okay, yep, how much it'll cost them. Mm -hmm. What they'll actually get out of it, well, I know here in Chicago, uh, people who employ individuals with disability, they get a tax break incentive. Tax credit. Um, and yeah, so they that's one of the big incentives. And we try to talk with them about that's why they're most of those ones they're under our supportive employment, our SEP programs. And so we try to um or we even have a volunteer program, but one of my things. So it, we get it mixed up sometimes because they want the volunteers to come and work and not hire them. <laughs> And so they work them to death, but really it's the uh, tax benefit and the incentive here with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, I definitely agree with those factors. Um, I was thinking of it from like a social or like cultural aspect. Um, maybe if an employer is, I think it could go both ways. If an employer is hesitant or doesn't know much about um, uh, about how to um help a person with a disability like be in the workplace that might have them shy away from um including them in the workplace or mm -hmm. vice versa um if they if they want the workplace to be a more diverse place um and more like accepting place that might be something that they specifically seek out so that they can have that influence mm -hmm. yeah that makes interesting that makes me think of the competencies even the multicultural competencies because mm -hmm. this would be an area if you don't understand the clients who the client is you'll have you can have bias so be it a counselor or somebody who is in the, in the work environment that's very a good point that you brought out mm -hmm. all right so and i think we hit some of them right so those issues are employer perceptions which you just basically talked about um there's uh disability employment legislation and disability inclusion policies and procedures, and then technical assistance needed for employers um, and the job economy. So, got a video here for us to look at. It's a couple of minutes, but you have to look at and listen and sound, but it take a few minutes to place on exactly another way to explain the Minnesota theory of work adjustment. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm trying to. I was trying to move this so I can make it bigger. I apologize, everybody. Um. Don't worry about it.
So I want to ask a question. If anybody see, before I say anything, anybody see any similarities in this um, theory of work adjustment as it relates to any other theory that we may have come in um, counter with as it relates to this? If not, <laughs> hmm. I I just wanted to say that when I'm look when I looked at and read and actually looking through the video, there are a lot of common themes that relate to other areas. So like last time I shared about the strong um, interest inventory, even uh, a few people called Discover. It was some there's some other ones, but there's this common thing, and they just worded differently. I mean, they they folk they emphasize it differently. So when they, if you're talking about, um, you know, one's ability and um, how it relates to what you, what is it that you want to do and the requirements in terms of, the, you know, job satisfaction with an employer, these are some, um, some common, some common things in the work values. And the other thing that was showing before when it was having aptitude that was a little bit earlier, some of those things to relate to different themes if, if I was to connect that to the strong different personality themes so if somebody wants autonomy and let's just say they're um maybe they're wheelchair bound or whatever but their personality is very um engaging or in, you know they want to engage so they may um that they may be a type of person that will definitely advocate for what they want and um, anyway, it was just an observation. I know that there are some similarities that's there with other, other areas. And this is just a visual to try to get a different perspective. This is actually from the book that we, um, that we have on the, the Minnesota theory of work adjustment. So looking at the person, what their needs and values are, and the job environment, the abilities, the requirements of um, what it takes to do the job, jobs, fat, job satisfactoriness, and job satisfaction. So you're looking at the person and then the work environment. So I kind of look at about what five minutes left. <laughs> um, you're fine. So Keep fine. going. You're fine. Okay. Keep going. Okay. So employer perception, and this is. I think this is very important. And this is where, you know, we have to do where a lot of work comes in. So the demand side of employment research indicates that employers' misperceptions about individuals with disabilities remain a major barrier to employment for people with disabilities. That's important. You know, that goes back to, I'm, I'm going to still relate to cultural competencies. You know, you have to you break barriers down by seeking understanding. So we say we can assume that maybe in work environments, they may not have understanding or may not even have the desire to seek it. And so most the most common answers given by employers were they needed more accurate and practical information to dispel misconceptions and concerns about hiring and retaining people with disabilities. And they also talked about the ability of the people with disabilities to perform the type of work um, that the organization needs to be done. Mm -hmm. and this, this is where it's important for us, I mean, everybody to know your worth and know your skills, because sometimes the, the um, even a VR or even the client itself has to advocate, you know, you know, this is the, the educational thing, but um, it's important to, you know, advocate and, and shed a different light on things. Does somebody want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to add to that, Ama, uh, because this is what I do for work. So this is like completely um, within my wheelhouse. I train on these kinds of concepts um, to New York State. Mm -hmm. And um, just like you said, employers, uh, the biggest barrier to people uh, with disabilities working in the community is, is employers and the community. It's the social model of disability, which states that society disables people more than their actual diagnosis. So mm -hmm. inaccessibility to certain spaces, whether it's physical accessibility or social accessibility, um, definitely is more of a barrier. And, and, and people just don't know how to talk to people with disabilities. They don't know how to support. They like 
they don't know how to have relations with people with disabilities. They are like really such an othered group um, uh, of people. And um, yeah, like you're saying, uh, but we we also do it too. Like you're saying about being a competent professional, like in my trainings, I just taught effective job coaching today. That's one of our trainings for job coaches. And I have to kind of review with them that, you know, our job isn't to save the person's job regardless of what they do or what happens or how, you know, employment is a, it's a uh, agreement that this employer is going to pay this person to produce at value, right? You're going to show up on these days, these times, do these things, do them well, and you're going to get paid to do it. So sometimes we get in our own way when we either rely on the flexibility and the accommodations of an employer rather than the competency of the person. The person has to be competent in the job first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And we also, like you said, my last comment before I get off my soapbox, um, we also help with dismantling these um, myths about people with disabilities. And this is like my biggest thing when I train people is get assisting people with disabilities and getting into other types of jobs, other industries, not just greeters, baggers, stockers, cart pushers, Mm -hmm. and maintenance like that's the biggest thing is if we can get people with disabilities and it's possible i've done it out of these stereotyped and stigmatized roles they're very important roles they're very difficult role, roles to do they often have a lot of um overturn but they're stigmatizing people mm -hmm. the rest of society only uh encounter people with disabilities as these things not as their doctor or their teacher or their manicurist or mm -hmm. their post postal person they see them cleaning this fast food restaurant or greeting at a Walmart, or pushing carts. And it's not that I don't want people with disabilities to do those things. I want them to do those things and 50 other things. Right, and, and that's, the, that's job status. Then that speaks to the, the job satisfaction of the client. Right. right? So that they have a value, you know, that they have a value. And that I, I agree with you um, <laughs> wholeheartedly with that because that feeds into the style. You're just... You can do this because I and think just this, right? Yeah, you could do just this thing. You're not capable. You're not, you know. So, yeah. yeah. So we gotta, you know, dispel myths and mm -hmm. misconceptions and attitudes, you know, around it. Yeah. And so the, and the other thing is about the dollars, the bottom line, the healthcare costs, um, the work workers' compensation costs, and fear of lawsuits. You know, they also cite that as major reasons by small and medium sized companies as well and the, you know the interesting thing is this how we, I'm, i was curious like how we get all this information because you know in the interview process of course they can't say these things during the interview but <laughs> this is it oh. all right you mind if i chime yeah. in a little bit mm -hmm. so, um i when i was in my what's called practicum for me uh, i had a client that for a year and a half wasn't working and so when I was working with the client to help him like get a job because he did have a job, but they weren't paying him. They were just using him to take advantage of the funding that they were getting. So he ended up quitting. Uh, it took a few months to get him into a position. I mean, yes, he was very highly functioning, but it was pretty surprising how some employers would stigmatize him going into those interviews. Some employees be like, well, he never showed up. Somebody like that wouldn't be able to do a, an interview and those kind of things. And it took, for me, it took a lot of swallowing my pills, not wanting to curse at them because <laughs> uh, some of the stuff that was coming out of those employers' mouths. Um, but then there was one employer that, for some reason, said, I'm going to give the guy a chance and he's been working there ever since. And so I think in part of that too, when we are trying to help clients with disabilities get job, in addition to looking at their ability, we want to make sure that we ourselves are also talking with the managers, especially if you're doing like a job skills training or something. Uh, so like that, you can kind of get an idea if this is going to be a good fit for your client too. So mm -hmm. um, depending on that, don't always trust the client to necessarily tell you everything. Get a feel for yourself of the hire manager, the team, how's the work going? Because I, I worked with him for a few months. I got to see his work environment, see who was all working there. And then, you know, over time, I mean, fortunately for him, Everybody wanted to him and enjoyed him being there. And uh, he ended up getting a promotion and everything. He's still working at his site today. So, I mean, just those little extra things as far as checking with what the employer wants versus what you're offering them. 
and letting them know, you know, what the person can do, not focusing on disabilities or their abilities, will help the the, the managers and them make a decision to hire that person. Mm -hmm. And so that goes right into, I mean, you know, the reasons, right? Um, that positive attributes and good reasons for hiring people with disabilities. Um, it says that there's some, let me just read this so I can, okay. The, the, the negative attitudes of coworkers and supervisors and um, the lack of supply of qualified workers with disabilities are frequently cited as barriers um, to retain people and, and employers' misconceptions. And this is, uh, we've all, I guess we're like, like a broken record here, didn't have a lot of misperceptions about that. And that, um, and that the perception and some actually are one that, that people with disabilities may require, often require extra time to learn a new work task and people with disabilities often require costly reasonable accommodations. These are some of the perceptions. And um, so you're looking at things as like specialized equipment, faculty modifications, adjustment to work schedules or job duties. Um, that people with disabilities have trouble getting their work done on time and often need others to help them finish the job. And other perceptions are that people with disabilities tend to call in sick more often than other workers due to health or personal reasons. And that people with disabilities tend to be, what is this word, litigious? <laughs> and that they have trouble getting along with others on the job. This is such a I should, I was being reported. Okay. People who are not very comfortable with working with people with disabilities. So these are some more of their um, perceptions. Now, um, in terms of the, um, let me just read it out so I can collect the thoughts. So supervisors, professional supervisors working for um, employers known or reputed to be resistant to complying with it with the ADA um, Act employment provision that they found the main reason employers were not hiring people with disabilities can be attributed to their lack of awareness that we're talking about disabilities and accommodation issues, concern over cost and fear. So it's like addressing fear and stereotype. This is what we're this is what we're saying. We are saying the same thing that they're saying. <laughs> and um, and this even impact recruiting as well, recruiting efforts. Now here I just want to focus on the um, some disability legislation, just say Title I employment of the ADA requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations for qualified workers with disabilities to perform its essential job functions. And, um, and that there's a lot of research that examine the, um, the effect of legislation to promote inclusion of people with disabilities in the workplace. And it says, however, there was no conclusive evidence to support the effectiveness of the ADA as a mechanism to improve the employment rate of people with disabilities. Um, this is a, a lot of statistics. I'm going to go past this one because basically it, it's um, talking about how um, people are hired, what's the quota based upon different countries and things of that nature. I might not be on, on the test, but now, Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act requires all federal contractors to establish a 7% utilization goal of inclusion, of including people with disabilities in their workplace. Okay, this is from the U.S. Department of Labor 2014. Um, and for the, it's the 50,000 in federal contracts, the 50-50 rule that um, companies that do not meet the 7% Utilization goal are required to take steps to determine whether 
and where um, impediments to equal employment exist. This includes assessing existing personal processes, the effectiveness of its outreach and recruitment efforts, uh, the result of affirmative action, program audit, and other areas that might affect the success of the affirmative action program. Now, um, since the evidence, since there is evidence that countries using an employment quota system have smaller disability employment gaps than the United States, um, demand side researchers are beginning to study disability inclusion policies, procedures, and practices of uh, Section 503 companies. Let's see. Now, disabilities and business technical assistance. I just want to, I like, I just highlighting the major, what I thought was the major points. And again, you have the whole presentation to go into details, but one of the major findings was HR managers who are knowledgeable about the ADA and reasonable accommodations were more positive about hiring people with disabilities. So education and awareness is very key at, at, at this level, at the hiring level. And um, it says that the there's a, a the, dis, the, dip, the disability the disability inclusion profiler that can be used by rehabilitation counselors and other disability services provider to work cooperatively with business organizations to assist the strength and limitations of the disability inclusion policy. So I don't, are you all familiar with the JAN Accommodation Net, um, Network? Anybody ever looked at that or used it? So it, does, it has a lot of information on there. You can type up anything. It's excellent. You know, you can type up any condition. It's going to give you a whole lot of resources in terms of legal, what the, the, what the client can have, websites, uh, assistive technologies, apps. It's, it's wonderful. They have a lot of information. Um, and then there's also the employer assistant and um, resource network on disability inclusion. That's another website. So it provides technical assistance to help um, recruit, that help employers recruit, hire, and retain, and advance people with disabilities. Um, I think I wanted to ask, do you find that who works with supported employment that they, you all use the EARN website? I use Ask EARN. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great resource. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing here, I think we're, well, I think I'm getting there, I'm almost done. Demand disability inclusion practice research. So demand side employment research indicated several um, major organizational factors that, char that characterize companies with high representation of people with disabilities in the workforce. They found that normative belief um, at the, it says comments at the leadership and executive level that trickle down to all levels of organization. So that, that, that okay, they found that normative belief, diversity, and disability inclusion policies and procedures, it's a strong focus on ability, not disability. So it's shifting the perspective, right? Um, knowledge and experience providing job accommodations and workplace support characterize companies that are committed to hiring and supporting people with disabilities in the workforce. And they also found out that companies that include disability in their diversity and inclusion policies and procedures have higher representation of people with disabilities in, their, in, in the workforce. And as, we, as the other slide did talk about HR managers who are knowledgeable um, about ADA and reasonable accommodation. So if they, basically this slide is saying the more aware key staff management and leadership are, um, the more we're going to have inclusion, value, and respect, and some level of equality. Um, and yeah, that's what that says. <laughs> We're almost, I'm almost, oh goodness, I'm almost done. How many slides do I have? I'm not, 
<laughs> I'm trying to finish up y'all, sorry. Um, okay. All right, so there was a study done on the theory of planned behavior. And the construct consists of attitude, subjective norm, perceived behavior control as predictors of hiring intention. And it says, although both attitude and perceived behavior control make significant contributions mm -hmm. to the prediction, subjective norms were found to be of greatest importance. So they concluded that company climate related to disability inclusion <clears throat> is influenced by normative beliefs. Okay, so it's, it's saying the same thing. Okay. Uh, so it would be kind of um, redundant with this. Okay. Let me go back. So effective disability inclusion practice. I'm just going to go right here. Um, and some research that was done found that disability inclusion practices can be classified in two levels of practice. Level one, the, ex the executive level of disability inclusion practices represents the commitment of leadership of the organization to support the inclusion of people with disability and their efforts to influence down and across the organization to drive behavioral change, a top-down approach. So not just within their division, but company-wide. And the second level is mid-management um, practices um, have a focus on the implementation of disability inclusion practices by the mid-level managers uh, and staff to recruit, hire, and retain um, people with disabilities. So overall, this is like, it's this infused, they wanna make this like some a common theme that's infused in every aspect. And so how they look to apply it in other ways is through paid internship programs, partnering with state um, VR agencies and community-based rehabilitation organizations, social service agencies, et cetera, to recruit individuals with disabilities and put some of the practices. Um, does anybody want to say something? I thought I heard somebody. Okay. So this is just going over and over about the different atmospheres and environment that is um, required. Okay. All right. Let's see here. What else do I want to say? When the supply of workers is higher then the demand for workers, oh yeah. Employers will be more reluctant to hire people with disabilities, yeah. And then we OWA, we OWA um, provides a blueprint for integrating the supply side employment approach to the demand side um, by increasing um, VR agencies to increase their capacities to conduct local labor market analysis, engage employers, and um, customized training, you know, setting up training for a specific, you know, uh, uh, groups. And also looking at, I don't know if it says this, but, you know, with the local the local labor market analysis is seeing what's needed in your area or region. Okay. So, and then also helping employers to assist their disability inclusion policies and procedures uh, using assessment tools such as DIP. So they're doing a whole lot here. <laughs> so in conclusion, I'm just gonna end on this. It's a nice video on um, hiring people with disabilities. We'll take a look at that and then that will be, uh, take any questions. It's kind of some, this is like a summary of everything. <laughs>I believe everybody, everybody disabled, disabled or not, deserves a chance to make something of themselves. What I'm looking for as an employer is somebody who's motivated to work. It's really important that people with disabilities are given the chance to work because they are so dedicated and they love their jobs and they love coming to work.
People have a choice of where they're gonna spend their money. It could be for price, it could be for location or product, but it's also what the company stands for. So it's really important that businesses hire people that reflect the community. It is good business to hire people with disabilities because it strengthens and adds diversity to a team. Clarence is a courtesy clerk here and he sacks customers' groceries and then he takes them out to the car. He just wants to help. He's that giving type person. I'm a bagger. I sweep the stores and the floors up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh-oh. The food town. He's self-motivated and has a great work ethic. It tends to rub off on other employees as well. He's worked for our company since 2008. We're very proud and appreciative to have Clarence on our team. Clarence has exceptional customer service skills. He brings a smile to work every day, and he knows more people by name here than I do. Cole is a shining example of somebody who loves his job and loves his work. I like working at Home Depot because I like helping customers. What's unique about Cole is his zest for wanting to figure out things and offer more and be able to solve problems for both customers and associates. We have a Home Depot app where you can look up products and locations and he does not hesitate to assist customers when they come in. He almost knows the entire store like the back of his hand so if I have a question I have no problem going to him and getting the right answer. There's been a few times that we've been out and I've had Cole with me and people will come up and they're like, is that your son? They've told me stories of how I was in Home Depot the other day and he's just such a great worker. I have good friends at work. I can't thank Cole enough for being the guy that he is and the attitude that he brings to this store just makes it enjoyable for everybody. Customers have a lot going on in their lives and their day and they come in here to get help for whatever need it may be and that smile to kind of help them know that we're here to serve and here to take care of them is something that we spend a lot of time training our associates but with Cole it's an automatic every time. He's a great employee and there's not a lot that I have to do other than just encourage him, fill his tank and let him know he's doing a great job. Eric makes a friend out of everybody. Everybody he talks to loves him. I like everybody. The first time I met him, he told me I work all day and I work hard. And that is true. Eric is one of the hardest workers I've ever been around. He does everything with a smile and a positive attitude. He's very positive. He comes into work very high energy. And that energy transfers to our guests and to our employees. That's something that warms my heart to see that Eric has found a second home with his co-workers there at Whataburger. Whataburger is my family. There are so many people in place from the state level to the local level to make sure that each one of our individuals is supported. Employers find out it's an advantage to their business because it makes their customers understand they too are compassionate. After watching Clarence work, I've gone ahead and hired several other people with disabilities and watch them grow with the company as well. You're gonna get an employee that wants to be there. You're gonna get an employee that's gonna show up on time. You're gonna get an employee that's gonna give you 100% every day that they show up. And they're gonna make a positive impact on your company. It's incredibly important for any business to reflect their community and give that individual a chance to show what they can really bring to the table. It's a great opportunity for everyone. No one misses out. Okay, and that's it. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or comments? Very thorough, like you say, a conclusion and put the icing on the cake and you did a really good job. Thank you. <laughs> you did an excellent Alma. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, yeah. thank you. And Kenny, I have to thank you very much for your help or give me some motivation and some ideas. Like how to put a video in a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> now, the more you know, the more you know. So, okay, so with that though, um, I sent those slides out and everything. So everybody should have them on the email distro list. The uh, next one though is gonna be Margaret. So um, you can take it from here. Did you want me to put your presentation up? I got it, thank you though. Okay. Thank you, thank you.
All right, so I'm doing, hold on, let me move my Zoom stuff around. So By the way, I like how it's easy on my eyes. I never thought those color transitions would be a, a, a nice comparison looking at a screen, just yeah. FYI. Yes. Um, all right, so community resources and partnerships. Um, that is what this is about. If you have, if you have quite the, this one's going to be a little bit different than what I'm just did because there's a lot of terms and definitions. So, um, but I work with these pretty frequently and pretty often. So please, if you have questions, ask your questions. So the rehabilitation counseling process generally involves the integration and coordination of multiple services and supports that people with disabilities have to access within their communities. Right. So they're there's frequent concurrent services uh, and resources that the people we're supporting can benefit from. They participate in different programs. Sometimes these programs play nicely together. They're supposed to write uh, multiple different kinds of um, supports to cover kind of all the bases that someone might need. So that's what this chapter explores. Um, and these are the different um, Areas for community resource. So we've got healthcare and diagnostic, rehabilitation and vocational services, career and technical education, community living resources, leisure and recreation, legal and advocacy services, and social services. And we have to become familiar with these various um, services in the community that can help different people access um, what it is that they need or even accessing these services themselves. The more knowledgeable we are and the more well-rounded we are, the better we'll be able to help. Um, you know, the various people that we're supporting. Um, so uh, when we become aware that someone that we're working with is concurrently receiving services from another treating professional, communication between us and, and them should happen, right? Uh, we should all work together towards the common goal for that person, whatever it is. Our services should be complementary. So the first one, healthcare and diagnostic services. Um, it's important to, to recognize that disparities in the access to the delivery of healthcare services um, across a wide variety of medical conditions has been documented among the US populations of people with disabilities. So um, although there are these disparities, um, they're more pronounced within you know, people with disabilities in those populations. So it's necessary for us to advocate for people that we're working with to provide supportive information and resources to promote um, self-advocacy efforts for people with disabilities, again, to get the services they need, to get their needs met, so on and so forth. And these are just some examples of the type of healthcare and diagnostic services that might be available for people. Next, we got rehabilitation and vocational services. So um, these services aim to help the rehabilitation counseling uh, clients obtain or maintain employment, including vocational rehab, support employment, assistive technology, uh, forensic rehabilitation, and education or training services. Rehabilitation and vocational services are indispensable tools for community participation by individuals with disabilities. Effective VR services reduce and remove a variety of barriers to employment for uh, uh, and barrier, barriers to employment and community participation, which both increase quality of life. So it's important to note, I looked at this and I saw this one, and then number seven, I believe, is different. So this is state VR. This is um, state-based VR, whatever your VR service uh, uh, or, or VR funding source um, is, wherever your state is. In my state, New York, it's Access VR. Um, so this is the state funding source. This is not the non-for-profit. The state funding source refers to the non-for-profit and they do the hands-on work with the person. So, um, and then some of the services just to go into it, because I feel like a lot of people don't realize this. Um, ba, ba, ba. So they could provide assistance for assistive tech and do assistive tech assessments. Um, forensic rehabilitation is um, people who have past criminal records, so um, assisting that. There's also, in terms of forensic, is people who have past criminal records looking to, you know, re-enter the workforce. And then there's um, re-entry, people looking to re-enter the workforce, but that's people who are uh, hot off the press from the DOC. So a little bit different um, in terms. 
And then they also offer education and training services. They can help fund a degree or a continuing education certificate of sorts. Some also help with driving. I know the one in New York, they assist with learning to drive. So career and technical education. These services provide people with the vocational education and skills needed to work. These services may include adult education, special education, support employment, or job training, as well as education and training related to independent living and public or specialized transportation. So like I said, this, this um, resource for career and technical education in New York, our VR and our career and tech education are combined. In. So um, some states might have individuals, some might also have combined. So community living resources. These services include public housing assistance, um, supported housing for people with disabilities, state or local housing and rental assistance programs, accessible recreation and leisure resources, and informational resources. Legal and advocacy services include information related to the Americans with Disabilities Act, such as uh, what might be available through a regional network of ADA centers, and those centers provide information, training, and technical assistance on the ADA. Uh, or it might be local organizations providing reduced costs or pro bono legal services. A lot of times we're going to get into CILs later, Centers for Independent Living. A lot of times Centers for Independent Living have legal and advocacy services. And then social services may include national or local programs and services that exist to promote the health and well-being of individuals, families, and communities, such as those available through the U.S. Department of uh, Health and Human Services. Um, so uh, social services might look like assisting, might be the Department of Social Services, might be DSS, and it can help. they can help with getting people on um, temporary assistance for needy families. It might uh, supplemental nutrition assistance program, which is SNAP, used to be food stamps, right? Uh, the Head Start, um, which I believe is, um, and if someone else knows what exactly this is, but I believe Head Start programs are for um, educational programs for children in low income communities um, to get a head start for school. So they might start at like three or four years old and it's free. It's a free, like, um, educational service and services for the homeless, seniors, veterans, and aid with federal benefits. Social services may also include regional and local agencies, including departments, social services, and specific uh, programs and agencies. And a lot of the, the temporary assistance for needy families in SNAP, if you do do a, a tax, they also are uh, qualify for tax credits as well. When somebody goes to do the work opportunity tax credit, for example, that's just one of many that there are. They ask about, um, you know, people who, forensic folks who, um, have you committed a felony, have you committed a crime? Uh, people on temporary assistance for needy families, people on SNAP, people getting SSI, people getting SSD, veterans and people who um, have disabilities because that work opportunity tax credit, as the name states, um, Opportunity, work opportunities for populations that have a harder time entering the workforce or um, that are on, um, you know, government assistance and we're wanting to get them off government assistance and so they can be more self-sufficient. So uh, the last one is community-based rehab programs. So these are the nonprofit organizations that VR or DDRO, um, DD or ID, um, funding sources in your state refer people with disabilities to. So there are community-based nonprofit organizations that provide employment and rehabilitation services. These programs provide or facilitate the provision of employment and related services to individuals with disabilities. Um, and these services include often voc evaluation or assessment, job development, training, placement, retention services, support employment services, and job coaching. I do all of that. If anyone ever has questions about any of that, please contact me. So my organization has a lot of similar programs like that as well. Yeah. Uh, actually, pretty much all of it is a one-stop shop for everything. 
just depends on the person's needs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this is an example um, of um, the a type of um, disability that can get funding from multiple places. So funding can come from grants from the CDC, from the state, a local, federal government. So this slide, um, it's supposed to say page 257. You could find more examples. So um, the text says rehabilitation counselors should be familiar with and maintain for ready use information about the programs and services at local, state, regional, and national levels that are relevant to the clients they're serving. Uh, programs and services for people with disabilities include local state regional programs as well as national programs funded through the federal government, possibly CDC. So this is an example right here um, of how all the different places which we could pull funding from for a specific disability. We're getting into Social Security. If anyone has questions on Social Security, please ask, okay? Um, so Social Security, um, Social Security Administration, SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI. Um, here's the definition for disability under Social Security um, Administration. Uh, SGA, Substantial Gainful Activity, is what SGA stands for. And we're going to get into what that means. Um, and it, sa it says it right here, actually, work activity is substantial if it involves doing significant physical or mental activities or a combination of both, but the work need not be performed on a full-time basis. And gainful is performed for pay or for profit. So usually SGA is income. That's usually what it refers to, um, at least on a part-time basis. So Social Security Administration provides disability benefits through SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, and SSI, Supplemental Security Income. The Social Security uh, Administration uh, has a definition for disability, which is right here, the inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity by reason of any medical, uh, medically determined physical or mental impairment that could be expected to result in death, so it's chronic, it's ongoing, or has lasted or can expect to last for a continuous period of not less than 12 months. So again, being chronic, being ongoing, um, and uh, it, in terms of resulting from death, it is, it is a you know, serious condition that is impacting um, daily life functions, including going to work. Um, let's see, let's see. You get a person, I'm sorry, I have a quick question. Yeah, of course. The person gets money, like cash, I mean, money to use in both of those areas, SSI and SSDI. Correct. Correct. So they get money, they get a check. Check, in my experience, checks have been, 600 700 800 dollars for the month something like that sometimes they're a little bit more it depends and we're going to get into the parameters for each one so they get a check of money in the beginning of the month so third of the month or the seventh of the month something like that and um they also get insurance medicaid or medicare funded insurance medical insurance so um and there's ways that their eligibility goes away and there, there's a lot of different things to it I'll, i have um, pre the outline for it on the slides of um, the different things that you, you need to know. Um, so Social Security Administration benefits, disability benefits are funded through different sources. SSI is funded through general tax revenues. So we want kind of, the government wants people to get off SSI because it's, being, it's being paid from taxes. If people can work, we'd like them to work. Um, and SSDI is funded through the Disability Trust Fund, which is a separate account in the U.S. Treasury into which a proportion of the payroll taxes received under the Federal Insurance Contributions Act, FICA, and the Self-Employment Contribution Acts are deposited. So one is funded through a special you know, disability trust fund, and you'll, you'll see why. SSI is for typically for people who have um, developmental disability. They're born with it. Uh, SSDI is usually for acquired disability. Um, SSI, I'm going to amend that. SSI is for uh, people who are usually born with a disability. And it, I have it on one of the slides. I believe people over 65, they get SSI. SSDI is 
an acquired disability and there's a whole process that goes with it. Some people get both SSDI and SSI. Can I chime in? Yeah, absolutely. Bit? So one of the big problems with people on SSI or SSDI, what Margaret's saying was that if they make too much of a little of an income, the government takes away their benefits. Um, if you guys were here during one of the first presentations I gave, which I would encourage you to look at it if you haven't, there was a big protest against the whole amendments to the uh, Social Security. I think it was in 2014 when they were trying to get rid of certain benefits because those people that were in SSI, SSD, I would have lost a lot of benefits to them because of the enactment. With that, uh, clients, if they're coming to you, you're, you might probably hear frequently is that if I go to work, I'm going to lose my benefits. And part of that is being able to work with them and dispel some of those misconceptions. Now, granted, depending on their situation, they may only be able to work X amount of hours a week and make no more income of, let's say, I don't know, 10 or 11 an hour, which those you can work with like a job accommodation or something. And then for some of them, though, um, they might be willing to work more, but you got to hope that the company and each other, the working board is going to be kind of permanent and it's going to provide better benefits than what the Social Security has. And I, I just actually, I had a client recently coming in for my services for an internship and he told me, he says, I can't go through the program if I'm required to find a full-time employment job. And I said, I know. So I'm working with my management right now to see if whether um, we're going to let him proceed forward and cover for his internship for the WIOA or if we're going to just refer him elsewhere because back in, he won't meet, he won't, me numbers, but on the flip and on his side, we don't, I don't want him losing his benefits because he's making too, just a little bit, a couple of dollars extra. So it's yeah. pretty interesting. It's like a rabbit hole because then you have to look at the cost of living for a person. So somebody is, I'm looking at this, somebody's monthly rent can be 1500, 2500. Right. Well, here's here's the thing with it. I I'm, haven't gotten to it yet. I have it in a few slides, but I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Um, SSDI is temporary, as and we're gonna we're gonna talk about it in just a second. SSI is usually the one that people are afraid of of um, are afraid of losing, but um, it's monthly income and it's insurance. The insurance doesn't. If somebody makes more money than what is allotted, and I'll tell you what the formula is for that then they'll they'll lose they'll it, it it gets adjusted every month so they're not going to lose it as soon, they have to report their wages and their wages for the next month or their their check rather will be adjusted based on what they made for the month before so it it all evens out so if last month you know i made 800 a month this month i made only 200 my ssi will go up because of that change, you have to report your wages. So people, a lot of people, there's a lot of misinformation and where people can get benefits advisement is the one stop career centers, which I'm gonna talk about, independent living centers, which I'm gonna talk about. Really important for people to understand, they will always, to your point, Alma, they will always, always, always make more money off of uh, benefits, always, always. But- I have, I have something to say too, when you get done. Sure, but they have to, be able to sustain that job, which is the challenge, right? For some people, yeah. they might be able to sustain sustain a full time job, um, and be able to to make that more money. But for some people, working fifteen hours a week is just about their max, and it makes sense to, to do both. Um, yeah, Cassie, what were you gonna say? Yeah, and it's and I was just about to chime in on, and it's not enough to live on. So here in Chicago, we have disability counseling uh not uh benefits counseling i mean and so that benefits we we try to connect them because you know again I, I think i said earlier in in one of the other meetings that you know people are afraid to work but with the with the um benefits counseling it tells them all the way to the penny of how much they can make and they like that and the parents you know a lot of the parents like it because sometimes they feel like the student is just sitting around or the individual and they're not doing anything, but if they can go out and work. And I have I have some people from the benefit uh, benefits council, they can only work five hours a month and they're happy. You know what I'm saying? And it won't interfere with their, their monies and what they're bringing home. But then there are some, I don't know how they base it. They can work right at, you know, a hundred and some hours, 80 plus hours 
You know what I'm saying? And it's still right. not cut their money. So it just it all depends. And like you say, you'll tell us about it, but it's it's real interesting how they do it because if they go over one penny, they cut them off. And and it's a it's a process to get them back on. So yeah. So this is this is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And there's um so so we're gonna start first with social security disability insurance. Okay. Now remember, this is for usually for acquired disability. So um, it came about in 1954. Uh, to, to Alma's question before, it is monthly income and Medicare insurance, okay? Um, they have to have worked for a sufficient period while paying Social Security taxes, be permanently disabled, and earn less than the substantial gainful activity in order to get the SSDI benefits. So uh, it's not temporary disability, right? It's, it's permanent disability, acquired disability. They're earning less than the SGA, which um, I'm going to annotate on my screen. The um, SGA for someone who, the substantial gainful activity for someone who's not blind, they have to make less than $1,470 a month. So I have this question before, if you're, if you're, if, if I'm a person and let's say I recently um, am vision impaired or I'm recently um, had a stroke or I recently something and um, I get on disability SSDI because I don't really know what life's going to look like for me. I don't really know, uh, but I'm in a rehabilitation program. I have interventions. I have different kinds of treatment and I'm starting to get my groove back and I'm, I'm figuring out what kind of jobs I can do and, and um, how much of my past skills I've retained and I'm kind of working towards um, rehabilitation. So if my limit is only making uh, $1,470, if that's my limit for SSDI of how much I can make, now let's say my SSDI check is five hundred dollars. That means in a month I'm making two grand. Which, to Amma's point, what if my rent is only fifteen hundred? I have to live off five hundred dollars. So that's when people go, okay, I have the capacity to make more money to suit my living needs. I'm going to forego the SSDI, and I am instead going to. Uh, it was good for a while. It was good for the interim, but I have regained my employability, and I want to get off of this, these benefits and work full-time, right? So um, this is continued. So the trial work period, and I have another slide about the trial work period as well. So um, the trial work period allows someone to test their ability to work for at least nine months. It's nine months in a 60 month period. So it could be three months here, two months here, one month here. So, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be nine consecutive months. It's in a 60 month period. Um, so you test your working ability for nine months and, uh, you'll receive the full SSDI benefit payments. Your payments don't get touched for nine months. And no matter how much you earn, as long as you're reporting your work activity and continue to meet social security's rules for disability. So the reason they do this, it's a good thing. It's not a good thing, right? You're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by letting them know if, if you can for nine months, get $600, $500, whatever it is, and make three grand a month or whatever, that's cake. That's, you know, that's, that's <laughs> using the system to your advantage. But then when you get off of it, social security, you were reporting, they're like, you worked 80 hour weeks or, you, you know, what that's exaggerative. You worked 50 hour weeks. Like you are fully capable to work. Now we saw your pay stubs and whatever it is. And you kind of can't really go back on to the system, which is a good thing. Um, I had someone who came to me once he had an acquired disability and he wanted to play that game. He was like, I want to rejoin the workforce, but at a very high paying position, because for my nine month period, I want to make as much money as I can and keep my SSDI check. And I was like, I respect that. Um, you know, he, he came in with a, with a game plan to make, to, to make it sustainable for himself. Um, so that is SSDI. Um, I have some notes here. Let me see. Um, so in this context, substantial gainful activity refers to a specific amount of monthly earnings that we talked about, the $1,400. Um, let's see. Um, eligibility is based on contributions the worker or in some cases a spouse or parents made to FICA while employed. Uh, because there are several variables that affect SSDI eligibility that vary annually or by characteristics of the applicant, including the number of work credits required for eligibility. It's important that we maintain awareness of current eligibility criteria because it can change. 
Um, let's see. So supplemental security income. Sorry that this is a little, a little off. So how this works. This is for people who usually, again, um, it says it, uh, people with low income, uh, people with disabilities, um, people age 65 years or older. Um, it provides cash assistance payments and Medicaid eligibility. Now, Medicaid eligibility, not necessarily, med you know, you're eligible to get Medicaid um, insurance, health insurance, and cash assistance, same thing, they get a check. Um, to qualifying adults and children who meet the criteria, which is on the screen, the amount of social security, um, supplemental security income benefit is based on the individual's other sources of income and living situation. So this is like, you'll see a lot of things online, like, you know, we won't have equality until people with disabilities can get married without fear of losing their benefits. This is what they mean, because as a single person, I get SSI, I get a check, but once I'm married, I might not get that SSI because they're accounting my living situation and my spouse's income and, and things like that. Um, the federal government determines the maximum federal supplemental security income payment annually. Yeah, um, So I, I think you may have answered my question. This would be the same for if somebody who is a vet and they have some type of benefits, they wouldn't, and let's just say they had SSI or something, they couldn't have both. They have to have one or the other. Between SSI and SSDI? Or either if somebody say sometimes people are vet veterans and they don't, they're not working or things like that. I don't, you know, how does that relate? Like I, I don't know if there's a appropriate question to ask at this time, but it it I guess it could relate because if they had a job before and now they don't. Um, so that would fall under the SSDI where they they were working and now they're not. There's something that's going on. And maybe they would also receive SSI if they fall into one of these, you know, other categories. If there's someone with low income, um, if they're 65 years or older, if they have an acquired disability in addition. So could be. I, I think that there's, and maybe Kennedy can speak up because I know you work with vets more. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I can even do. Oh, I can tell you this much. Uh, I think Alma has her hand raised. Uh, oh, I, I can lower it now because I asked it. I just didn't lower my, and maybe you can, I'm lowering my hand. Yeah. So that client that I was telling you about, by the way, Margaret, I would love to refer him to you if you are closer, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're a perfect candidate uh, for that program that you were talking about. Um, he is 100% permanent or, or unemployed insurability through the VA. What that means is that by VA standards, he sh should never be able to work again. Social security disability can allow him a limited income to work. So with his case, he told me you couldn't make no more than about, I think no more than like 18,000 at max a year, making no more than maybe nine, $10 an hour uh, for 10 hours a week. So they're very limited as far as what they can and cannot do. Uh, I know for his case, which I'll share here with this, um, um, he is dealing with a very severe chronic illness that could be potentially terminal. So, you know, the hard part is that he's going to school, he's getting his training and everything, but in that job field, they're not going to want to hire him even for part-time or flex, they're gonna to wanna to keep him permanent full-time in his role. So the challenge will be, can you work with a company or can you get a company to work with them to work those very limited hours and salary? Hmm. So each each situation is unique, but with the VA, if they're getting this, if, they're, if they have a VA rating and they truly cannot work, they can collect for SSDI as well. But mm. if they collect for SSDI, they cannot, they cannot work at full regular time. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Was that what you wanted, Margaret, or was it something else? Yeah, no, yeah. I, I mean, I think I think that in I don't know the complete ins and outs of of I think that there's other kinds of um income and and uh funding for veterans just for being veterans. But if they're veterans with disability, then the disability piece comes into play when it's SSI or SSDI. 
Oh, okay. So with that too, yes, the VA has the, remember, vocational rehab was originally what, a federal program? So we have a Veterans Readiness and Employment, VRE. They do the same functions as, as uh, what a state-based VR agency does, except they do have a lot more funding. So if you have a person who's a veteran that's disabled and they want to come to your program for disabilities, they can, but ask them if they know about Veterans Readiness and Employment because they have a lot of money to help them to go to school and do stuff while they're disabled. And they have a lot of stuff for accommodations. But I, I use it myself. So. <laughs> so there's definitely a lot more benefits for veterans than there are for civilians, I'll tell you that. Yeah. And it's Thanks. also state-based too. So that, that veterans readiness, you said veterans readiness and employment, that's a national thing? It's a federal program. So if you Google veterans readiness, and employment, mm -hmm. majority of the people that work there are us, vocational rehab counselors, but they work on the federal side and they work with uh, disabled veterans and their family. Okay. And the same stuff, just way more funding. Okay, thanks guys. Um, one of the most important aspects of this is this last sentence. So people can still receive their Medicaid health insurance while working. In most cases, if they lose their job, they're unable to continue working. They begin to they can begin to receive their checks again without filing a new application. Because that's what people are most afraid of. They're like, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my bed. No, you're you're the money part. The money part is going to go down because realistically, if you're making money, you you don't. If the government says, hey, um, you have a disability, it it. Uh, impacts your ability to be self-sufficient and get income uh we're gonna give you 700 dollars a month you don't get to take that and then go i'm gonna go work now i'm gonna go work 20 hours a week and you know make 300 dollars. now i make a thousand dollars a month no if you're getting money from the government because you're deemed not fit to work in whatever way not not ready don't have resource whatever it is then you don't get to keep both you don't get to go to work and keep your government benefits they're going to adjust the benefits and I'm going to show you how they do that but they that's, still keep the Medicaid it's really keeping that's also keeping people oh never mind I was about to say something <laughs> no you can say it I was saying it's really like keeping people you're still keeping people in, po in poverty yes and it goes back to what I was the the presentation I was you know talking you know doing and it's um sorry it's just keeping people it's a cycle of poverty right uh, it, it is no it definitely is it definitely is and mm -hmm. and that's why the education piece is so important mm -hmm. so i'm going to show you da, 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 da. i'm gonna just do an example okay so it said that the earned income exclusion is that the first 65 or 85 if the individual has no income other than earnings um of any monthly earned plus one half remaining earnings are excluded from SSI benefit compensation purposes. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like, okay? I'm gonna use round numbers for the sake of using round numbers. So let's say somebody uh, gets $885 through social security disability, um, or, or just kidding, sorry, supplemental security income. I mean, social security disability. Dog is chasing my cat. Okay, so they get eight hundred eighty-five dollars through SSI, right? And let's say, um, they go to work, and at work they make uh four hundred dollars a month. So let's say four hundred dollars in the month, right? At work. So what they end up doing is they take this $400 and they cut it in half, okay? So that gives you $200, right? And then they take, it's $85. Um, if the individual has no income other than earnings, they get the earned income exclusion is $85. So what you end up doing over here is you minus 85 and you also minus 200 because that's the that's the magic number over here so the new earnings this is how they calculate it is 885 uh, minus 85 is 800 minus 200 is 600 that's the new ssi number for that month so the person how much money did the person make 
right? Um, let me do a different color. They made ooh, 600 plus 400. So they made $1,000. Um, whereas if they were not working at all, they would have got 885. So they made a little bit more money, right? Um, so I'm going to clear this. How do people lose their benefits completely momentarily, right? It's for that month because it, remember it fluctuates. The answer is here. So um, where's the text? So if somebody makes, again, 885 per month for SSI. And now let's say this month for work, um, quick maths right here. Uh, actually, I don't need quick maths because it's going to be 1600. Somebody at work had a great month. They made 1600 per month per month at work for this month. And so now, again, you cut that in half. So, and that equals 800. So now this is uh, 800 is the magic number we're going to cut from. You're still going to minus that 85 because that's the, uh, what's it called? The earned income exclusion. But now for them, our magic number is 800, which means they got zero. This makes sense. Does anyone have questions on this? No, I just, this sad. I'm sorry. I didn't know I was mute. I was like, this is just sad. Yeah. I, I mean, so what, like I said, if somebody, uh, somebody can always will if they can right it's the ability of the person but they they will always make more money off of um in off of benefits if they can if they're able to they they can definitely make more money full time and people often people say um and i heard i heard this earlier because this is the common misconception you know what the the um social security administration is probably telling people this but um, a common misconception, especially with minimum wage rising, is it's not people are limited to hours. It used to be like, oh, I can only work 15 hours a week. I can only work 20 hours a week. They look at it as a month, how much you're making in a whole month. So if you have, um, let's say someone works um, at, at a school and it's it's the month of June, right? In, in New York, we're out of school for June, July, August. But June, you're still in school until let's say the 20th of June. So let's say uh, you know, they're not going to be in school for the last week or two weeks of June. They could work more in the beginning of June. So it's not like they can only work 10 hours, only work 15. They have to do the math to make sure that they're not, um, if their SSI is 800, that they're not hitting 1600 in that month. Otherwise they're going to get zero. So it's about how much they're making, which with minimum wage rising in some places, it's, it's, you know, you're, they're going to hit that number sooner with minimum wage rising. Any questions? Hmm. No, I'm hearing they refer some clients to you here in a minute. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hope you're willing to work remotely, Margaret. I work remotely now, so. <laughs> what state right. are you in? I'm in New York. I'm okay. on Long Island. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I work technically upstate New York, um, close to like. Ohio and Pennsylvania or whatever, or close to Canada, actually. It's oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So I um I live down here, I work up there, but I don't really, I work down here. Um in my bedroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's benefits. Um now returning to work. So when people report their wages if someone's returning to work you got to report your wages you're gonna they're gonna owe money if they do not report their wages um they have to report a few things they have to report whether they stop work start work um uh if they've already reported their job that uh, hey i work here but if there's a change in duties hours or pay they have to write a letter or let i mean back in the day you used to write a letter i'm sure that there's a um there's an app here my social security i'm sure that it's such an easy thing to be able to do now um, but you have to, if you start paying for expenses that you need for work due to your disability or wees, you have to report it. Okay. I know someone who owed like $19,000 because he didn't report his wages and he took from the government and worked at the same time. And they were like, Hey, you owe us this money back. Um, 
So when people report their wages, they'll be given a receipt to verify that they've properly filled out their obligation to report. They should save that receipt along with their pay stubs so they can verify their monthly earnings and any deductions from allowable earnings. So this is a chart that is in the Social Security Red Book, I believe. I put the um, link in the chat. So it's the differences between SSDI and SSI, right? So where they get their funding from, um, SSDI, remember it's that disability trust fund, SSI, it's general tax revenues from, from our taxes. Um, so the minimal initial qualification, they have to be um, insured to the contributions they've made. So they have to have worked and poured into this fund at some point in order to benefit from the fund. Whereas um, for SSI, they have to meet the disability criteria and they have limited income and resources. Um, health insurance coverage provided Medicare versus Medicaid. Important to know, I can see that being a question on the test to throw us off. Um, and then how they figure their monthly, uh, their monthly payment and um, information on if the state supplemented payment is provided. So this is in the um, PowerPoint if you want to revisit this, but it's also in the Social Security Disability Red Book. So this isn't from our book, so it might not be on here, but just more information for you guys. Work incentives. So ticket to work or away pass plan. So ticket to work is um, I actually learned, I've heard about Ticket to Work for the longest time. I've never worked with someone for Ticket to Work and I've always wondered why, but now I know. So it was signed into law in 1999. It was designed to address the numerous vocational barriers faced by SSDI or SSI beneficiaries capable of returning to work. So the whole point of Ticket to Work is we want people who once worked to return to work. So this act incorporated and expanded some previously established work incentive improvements for SSI and SSDI. Um, and so um, it's an employment program designed to provide individuals receiving SSDI or SSI benefits with the supports needed to enter or re-enter the workforce, maintain employment, and become economically self-supporting over time. The reason I've never worked with anyone to Ticket to Work is because uh, the whole point of Ticket to Work is people who are once working, acquired a disability or impairment, and we want them to go back to work and off assistance. Everyone I've ever worked with is just, you know, they had autism yesterday and they have autism tomorrow and they'll have autism for the rest of their life. So they're not going back to work and off benefits because this is, they're not getting a ticket to work. They're just getting typical supports or, or the, the common supports that there are for people with disabilities. Um, so they receive a ticket, which they can use to obtain employment services, VR services, or other support services that enable self-support through a qualified vendor or provider of their choosing. Usually they're called employment networks. Um, they're, they're a little bit different than like a nonprofit, but a nonprofit can apply to be an employment network. Um, so they could be public or private providers and may include the state federal VR program or private rehabilitation companies or counselors. And they're paid through the ticket to work program. Um, just reading some of these notes that I have. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So trial work period. So this was uh this has to do with SSDI, Social Security Disability Income, right? It's that trial work period. It's a nine month period, right? It doesn't have to be consecutive. It's a nine month period. It's nine months really within a sixty month period. Um, so it allows part uh, recipients to engage in a work trial for at least nine months, not necessarily consecutive. During this period, the person continues to receive their benefits regardless of earnings and also get their earnings. Medical coverage through Medicare is continued for at least 93 months beyond the nine month period, beginning the month after the last month of the trial work period. So if the trial work period ends in March, then the um, 93 months where they still get Medicare starts April. Um, so this is more information just about that trial work period. Um, they're only entitled to one trial work period. They don't get to like continue with that benefit. And the trial work period is really to be able to say, hey, you're unsure about working. Um, 
let and it's also like I said, it's kind of they're putting their foot in their mouth there. They're um if somebody's really doing their best to to make make as much money as they can and get as much money from the government as they can, they're documenting on paper their capacities to work. So they can't ever really get out of that unless they have regression of some sort or um something like that, some kind of crisis or intervention on their functioning. And um so they're only allowed one of those. And this says there's a five-year trial period in which we could start uh, the cash benefits again without a new application. So in case you um, end your trial work period, and then again on SSDI, you can continue to get your benefits. You just have to remain below that 1400 and change, I think, $1,470. And that number changes. It wasn't always that number. It used to be 1099 back in 2012. So it does go up, it does change. No, with the SGA check yearly, I would say. So ERWIS, impairment related work expenses. So they're expenses for items and services that an SSDI or SSI beneficiary requires in order to work. For individuals receiving SSDI, the ERWI may be deducted from gross earnings for the purpose of determining whether one's work level meets SGA. For SSI beneficiaries, the early is deducted from the gross income for the purpose of determining the beneficiary's SSI payment amount. Um, to qualify as an early, the item or service must be necessary for the individual to work, be related to the individual's disability, be paid for by the individual, so it's an out-of-pocket expense, and be paid for the uh, be paid for by the individual in a month during which they worked. Important. Examples for airways uh, that may be deductible include attendant care services that help them prepare for work, like ADL skills, activities of daily living, uh, getting to and from work, so costs associated with modifications to a vehicle that is needed to drive to work to be driven to work, among other expenses. And there's some other examples over here. Um, SS, um, let me see. So that's an early. I haven't worked with too many people with earlies. Again, some of these things are less um, like how I compartmentalize them. Um, Social Security benefits. The reason there we have these um, incentive programs or these you know assistance programs is to get people off of benefits because that only you know helps us if we have less people relying on government funds, right? If we have, if people can be self-sufficient, we want people to be self-sufficient. So they have all these things in place that are temporary so that hopefully a person can be off services permanently, right? Or off assistance permanently. So they spend a lot of effort and funding and time into these services and these different things because people use them for a short amount of time, but then the return on investment is that they're off government assistance for, you know, hopefully for, for the rest of their lives. So um, impairment related work expenses, pass plans, ticket to work. You're not going to really find that with like people who have like CP or Down syndrome or autism spectrum disorder. Like these are for people who um, are usually more independent, want to get off. They're all about getting off benefits, getting off of assistance. So that is the goal because that obviously helps the government save money. Um, taxpayers not save money, but I mean, if if people got off, you know, enough people got off Social Security Administration benefits, there wouldn't be as much of a need for them, and then you know we wouldn't have to pay out of out of our um, paychecks and whatnot. So um, that's the whole idea with this. So it's mostly people with acquired disability, um, people who are a bit more independent and want to um, return to the workforce. If that makes sense. Pass plan, plan for achieving self-support. So uh, it allows SSI recipients to set aside income or resources so that the income or resource will not be considered when calculating initial and continuing eligibility for SSI payments. So um, savings, income and assets and other resources affect eligibility for SSI. Through a pass plan, an applicant or beneficiary may set aside income and resources that are used to pay for expenses related to employment, and this allows the individuals to establish and maintain SSI eligibility and increase their SSI payment amounts. So pass plans, um, you know, uh, pass plans 
you know, people with disabilities who receive their SSI and who receive um, uh, well, actually, this is kind of sort of for people who are not working yet. So um, people getting SSI, I'm getting a check every month, but I want to set aside some money to budget and save for things like, um, you know, education expenses or employment related assistive technology, transportation, funds to start a business, voc training um, without you know, Social Security, if they see that somebody has like $300 saved, they're going to be like, you know, what do you, they really do monitor how much money is in people's bank accounts for um, Social Security. You can't just be like living with family and banking in on this check. And, you know, they they do check in on things like that. But a past plan, again, is a written plan that um, states we're going to budget and save X amount of money to get this person to be self-sufficient and self-supporting. Like a lot of people can't plan to be independent if they don't have the funds to be able to, you know, plan for certain things they might need to get independent, certain work-related things or uh, education-related things. Uh, if a certificate is needed to get the certain job or the, a trade certificate, we have to set some money aside to be able to pay for that. But if you have too much money aside, your SSI benefits will go bye-bye. So um, that's what a past plan is, is mostly for. Uh, uh, hey, I really appreciate you sharing this, Margaret. These are definitely things we need to learn for these uh, for the CRC exam here soon. Um, with that, I, I know we kind of went over a little bit over time with the first presentation, and I apologize on that. But I want to, let me just pause this real quick. So independent living services. So um, uh, independent living is defined as being in control of one's life, choosing one's own goals and activities, and ultimately deciding one's own support system, including the strategies, people, and supports necessary to accomplish any given objective in the entire environment in which the support system is needed. It began in the 1960s, um, and it emer and emerged as a reaction against social, educational, health, and employment systems that imposed roles and expectations of dependency on uh, and that limited the choices of opportunities for people with disabilities. So think institutionalization. This was a, a, a very big reaction to institutionalization. Um, many people with disabilities in the 40s and 50s, um, it was recommended by doctors, institutionalize your children, send them to, to giant institutions to have a better life. Oftentimes not though, a lot of abuse, a lot of neglect that happened in institutions. So. Um, this is kind of a, a, a civil rights movement, um, the independent living movement, and uh, it was initiated and led by people with disabilities who wanted to take control of their own lives. They wanted less dependence and more independence, less caretaking, right? Um, so uh, the independent living movement. So at the University of California, Ed Roberts and several other students with severe disabilities attended classes, but because there was no accessible housing, they were forced to live at the, on the, at the campus's hospital. Uh, the group, which labeled itself the Rolling Quads, opened a campus program office to promote access and later in the early 1970s established the first Center for Independent, Li Independent Living, a CIL, for the broader community which came to serve as a model for the development of other such centers across the country. So the independent living movement believe that no one should be discriminated against or denied dignity, self-determination or equal opportunity simply because they have a disability and no one is a better expert on the needs of people with disabilities than people with disabilities. And the birthplace was Berkeley, California. So more on the independent living movement, the major concepts of the philosophy are that it is not disability that prevents people with disabilities from living independently, but external barriers such as stigma, attitudes, interpretations of disabilities, and architectural, legal, and educational barriers. That's the social model of disability. Uh, also, people with disabilities have the right to self-determination and to learn from their experiences. People with disabilities can be experts in their own self-care, People with disabilities must set the agenda for research and political actions in disability policy, and independent living services are, all, are mostly managed and administered by people with disabilities themselves. So legislation, 
Um, so independent living centers first came about in the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, but um, in the uh, 1978 amendments, funds were authorized for the provision of independent living services, and this funding has been maintained in all the different amendments. Um, Authorized under the Rehabilitation Act as amended by WIOA, the Center for Independent Living Program provides grants to, uh, to consumer controlled, but just people with disability controlled, community-based, cross-disability, non-residential, private nonprofit agencies to provide independent living services to individuals with significant disabilities. So Centers for Independent Living uh, funded by the CIL program are required to provide at minimum five core services. So information and referral, independent living skills training, peer counseling, individual and systems advocacy, and services that facilitate the transition from nursing homes and other institutions to home and community-based residences. Um, so uh, under the WIOA, in order to be eligible, da, 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 they must maintain an um, SILC, which I forget what it stands for because I Googled it and then I forgot. Um, it is a, hold on. Statewide Independent Living Council. And there's those definitions in the book as well. Um, and if you were to go and look, like a lot of the things that we're talking about today, if like I'm just going to they're they're kind of fe they're federally funded you know they, there's they have to be in certain places so like if I were to go to this is my independent living center here on Long Island and if I were to go to the services they all kind of have very similar services um uh all um kind of the same and so transportation advocacy which we're going to get to uh, benefits advisement, which we're going to get to, general guidance, peer counseling, which was said in the chapter as well, housing, ADA compliance consultation, independent living skills, which was discussed, equipment loan, and aging in place, and veterans with disabilities. So most independent living centers have the same kind of things like this. Um, I would definitely look into what your independent living center um, looks like, uh, where it is, and honestly, some of them, what's really great too, some of them have booklets like this. So this is for this independent living center and it's the blue pages. And it is literally just all different kinds of resources in my community. I forgot that I had this. Um, so if I ever need something and I come in here and I need um, counseling services or uh, services for heart impairments or home ownership or learning disabilities or legal services and assistance, or, you know, I can just come into here and it, and it gives me, it's like a blue, yeah, like a yellow pages, white pages, but they call it the blue pages. Um, your independent living center might have something similar to that with resources to give people. Um, and I just reviewed that, all the different things that are in the centers for independent living. And this is the um, this is from the textbook. So independent living centers, the philosophy, the um, I forgot it again. <laughs> this is going to be the question on the exam that I fail because I can't remember what this acronym is or the Center for Independent Living. I know the C is Council. Uh, statewide Independent Living Council. Got it. So financial literacy and benefits counseling. As you saw, benefits counseling can come maybe from your VR, definitely from your career one-stop center or American Job Center, and definitely at an independent living center. So um, da, da, da. limited financial literacy along with structural and systematic barriers, such as the limits placed on asset accumulation by means-tested public benefits programs. This hinders financial management and limits access to saving money establishing credit and making secure payments and economic planning, including preparing for economic and personal or health downturns. So people with disabilities don't have the most financial literacy, and this is something that we want to improve um, so that they can, again, do these basic, very human, very citizenship-oriented things like saving money, establishing credit, 
um, you know, being able to take out loans um, and things like that. So um, it gives you the differences here in definition for financial literacy, which um, more specifically refers to the practical knowledge and skills related to money management, which includes the ability to balance a checkbook, manage a credit card, prepare a budget, take out a loan and buy insurance, things that we all do at some point in our life. Uh, we can't just assume that people with disabilities don't need these things or need to know to do these things. We have to ensure that there's opportunities for them to gain financial literacy and financial capability. We're almost done. This is the second to last one. So the, C uh, C uh, the client <laughs> advocacy uh, program, CAP. And this is actually in the first chapter of the Red Book. There's a question on it. And uh, I put it right here. So the Rehabilitation Act amendments of 1984 require each state VR to have a CAP. So the client advocacy program, all people with disabilities who are um, receiving services or possibly receiving, potentially receiving VR services are eligible for a, a CAP services. CAP assists people with disabilities in resolving problems experienced during seeking and receiving the services. Using advocacy skills and negotiation, CAP attempts to resolve issues at the lowest possible level. If an issue is not resolved at the local office, CAP assists people who are receiving services in their appeals of decisions regarding services and also represents them in court if needed. CAP also works with community groups and advocacy organizations to resolve system problems. CAP is also responsible for providing information, public education programs on the rights of people with disabilities and referral to related services as needed. They're usually free and confidential, and the governor of each state designates an entity within a state to provide CAP services to help applicants or individuals eligible for services funded under the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 as amended by WIOA. So I've never really worked with anybody who's used this. I don't even think people with disabilities really know that this exists. Um, one person I worked with did the the um, client advocacy program. So if they just feel that 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 services aren't working in their best interest for whatever reason, they have the right to um, utilize the CAP program and and um, get representation and, and clarity and resolve at the lowest level possible. But it might escalate. There's a pair program, protection advocacy for individual rights. Uh, it's a uh, it advocates for protecting the legal and human rights of people with disabilities. Individuals with disabilities are eligible for the service in the following circumstances. If their concern is beyond the scope of, of a CAP, of a client uh, advocacy program, and the individual is not eligible for services from the HHS Protection and Advocacy of Developmental Disabilities program and Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness program. The main objective of PAIR is to advocate for minimizing the barriers to education, employment, transportation, and housing services, and promote community reintegration of people with disabilities. So it's just another thing that's out there. Honestly, I've never seen it be used. And as a VR professional, I should know about these things. You should know about these things so that we can advocate um, or help people advocate for themselves. So last but not least, there's one-stop career centers. So uh, One-stop career centers, they're also called American Job Centers. Here in New York, we try to call them American Job Centers, but they all have different names. Workforce One Centers, um, Rochester Works or Hempstead Works is what some of them are called. So, um, oh, I didn't do notes for this. That's fine. That's a good time. Um, so the One-stop career centers, such a great resource. Oh my goodness. They bring together employment and training programs in one place to make it easier for job seekers and employers to use these services. Every state has at least one one-stop career center in a major populated area. So they're majorly, majorly slept on. They're a great, great, great resource. Um, like if I were to show you, this is my work inbox, right? And if I were to type in Mary Frangle. Um, so Mary works at, uh, this is from Joel, but she sends these things to Joel. She's at the Department of Occupational Resources at the Career One Stop Center, and she's constantly sending out hiring events. She's constantly sending out about job fairs. She's constantly sending out like a porter needed. Like this made me reconsider like my job. I was like 25 an hour to clean. I love cleaning. Um, I do it, but it's, you know, it's part-time, five hours, one day, which for some of the people we, that I support, 
is a dream. They just want to work one day, five hours, $25 an hour. Um, not bad, not shabby. Um, but she's from the career one stop, um, American job center. And she's constantly sending out job leads for, um, different kinds of events and different kinds of jobs. Um, that's her job. And American One Stop Center, uh, American Job Centers aren't just for people with disabilities, it's for anybody looking to enter the workforce. So um, they have a lot of different things. So I'm going to show you a great website real quick. It's the last thing I'm going to do. So, you know, you can look for your career one stop um, directory for your state. But if you go to this website, this is like my bread and butter. This is another website, kind of like Ask Earn, but it's for the people we're supporting. So there's uh, different careers, different assessments you can do. Like Ama spoke about the interest assessments so the strong interest inventory that is on here. There's a skills assessment, a work values assessment. Um, there's different videos. There's like skill videos that talk about multitasking is when you blah, blah, blah. Um, and different videos for careers. So people can see what does a warehouse manager do or whatever. But if you want to find local help, click on it. I'm going to do just mine. Whoop. And it's going to tell me all of the closest AG, American job centers near me, right? And they're all created equal, but they're also, you know, not. Like some websites are way better than others. I remember this one's website it used to be horrible and it's better. Um, so it gives me all this information. Here's the description. Um, they have a lot of different job seeker and employer services. It tells you more. Um, this used to be Mary Drangle, but now it's Mimi. Mary moved on, I guess. It tells you if it's close to a bus or train, if there's a parking lot. Then it tells you about the different site resources. So they have fax machines people can use. They have telephones people can use. Copy machines people can use. You can go and use the per a computer if you're, you know, to do your resume or to apply for jobs. People can come here and use these things. They just have to register. And then they have youth services worker services to so like unemployment, unemployment uh, claims, uh, uh, preparing for job interviews, like all this stuff they have, so many things, and then business services. But also what they have, um, if you were to go to like a website, they have workshops, which I think are the most slept on. They have youth services, they have a lot of other stuff. But if I go to job seekers, disability services, uh, ticket to work, right? A lot of the stuff that we're seeing. But if I go to workshops and calendars, and they all kind of have the same classes, very similar classes. Um, so Microsoft Word Advance, two-day class, it's for free. Interviewing strategies, mock interviewing. This is an in-person employer presentation, interpersonal communication, another employer presentation beginner computer, and so on. They have a lot of different um, events, but also a lot of different classes and workshops that people can take. So it's a really, really great resource to utilize. Any questions? I'm gonna stop sharing. That's excellent. I like, that. I like that website as well. It's great. <laughs> it's a great website. Mm -hmm. And they have the, uh, is that, is it, it's either my next move or my skills, my future. Yes. Yep. That has, um, in addition to general, they have things for people who are veteran. I think it's mm -hmm. the crosswalk um, component as well. Yeah. Oh, and that has a lot of really, yep, the different crosswalks. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, um, the different ONET data that you can search. You can do a work values assessment. And then something else that I found out the other day through work, um, the ONET Resource Center, which blew my mind when I found this. I was like, what? Um, you know, going through all these is definitely very helpful, but um, something that I was looking at, um, Training videos, no, tools. So why am I? Uh, career exploration tools, I think it's under. They got the interest profiler, but they also have, where was it? They had other stuff that they had archived. Um, I think it's in questionnaires, actually. 
yeah so knowledge um this is a same kind of so this is these are the different onet domains there's work activities work context knowledges work styles and they give you assessments abilities assessment skills assessment which i thought was really cool they don't tell you how to grade it um which is interesting but i don't know i thought that was cool all right that's all i got Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I appreciate you on this. Thing. I appreciate the team uh, wanting to stay and learn this. I, I was learning quite a bit too. You know, I just was being a little bit mindful. But again, both of you ladies, thank you so much for this. Um, when I, I'm going to end the recording here.